Thank you. I'm, I'm very excited that I could be here. It's uh, been 10 years since I graduated, so I got my degree in political science. I'm originally from Nome, Alaska. My grandparents had uh, camps at Salmon Lake, Cousatrine, Teller, and Nook. And what that meant was they traveled seasonally to get um, the different food resources at each of the camps. And it was in the 50s when the government made the laws that all kids had to go to school that they had to get a home in Nome. So with that, that's where my dad ended up going to school. And when he had um, married my mom, who is from Washington, they lived in Nome, and that's where we were, we were raised. So I'm Inupak. The way that, um, how many of you are familiar with Native Corporations, Alaska Native Corporations? So some of you, are you from, any of you from Alaska? From Fairbank? From you're from Oregon, but you're familiar? So growing up in Nome, growing up in Nupac, um, the, the town history is that it was established by, um, because of the gold miners, and, but really there was the native activity happening long before that. And it wasn't until the Army Corps of Engineers um, excavated, they accidentally excavated a site. It wasn't until that happened in um, the middle, two, like 2006, 2007, that there was a recorded excavation of the native presence there. So up until then, even though my grandpa had said that's where the old people are buried, there was no acknowledgement that natives had been there before. So um, Anupak people are in Alaska, Canada, and Greenland. So that they migrated over. Then in the, so how we identify ourselves is based on our language. So I'm Anupak. That's the language group. I'm Cork Mute, which is the traditional place in Norton Sound. So the way to um, to look at um, where people come from, it's um, their region. So it would be Norton Sound or Bering Strait is where I'm from, and Cork Mute is the community that uh, my grandpa was from and my grandma. He was from Mary Ziegler, my grandma was from Shishmaraf. And so at some point in our family history, we just choose one. And so ours is Cork Mute. So that's the traditional way of identifying ourselves with our place and an overview of where my grandparents came from and how they were raising their family and then how I was introduced to living in the city. So Nome was a mile long and it had six streets. Um, well, it had, it had eight, uh, A through N and then one through six and a bypass and the high school was three miles out. And um, it's, the population's 3,500. They say it's about 3,700 now and it's about 1,000 miles from the nearest mall. And it's very close, this I didn't show, I should have shown a bigger map, but it's very close to Russia. So um, I left Alaska to go to school to, um, because I always, I didn't understand the conflict between state, local, and federal politics and why when an issue came up, people would say it was one of those entities' faults or, or they would complain about that. So I was fortunate to come to Western and graduate with my degree in political science and those papers that you have to write, they are, it, they're one of the best gifts that the professors could ever give you. And uh, Dr. Henkel saying um, or commenting, what's the significance? If you could just develop your writing pattern to say something and then state why it's significant, that will carry you a long way in graduate school. So I graduated from Western in 2006 and um, let's see, just, just this is my second year of graduate school. So I worked at the museum for eight years before it was transferred to the University of Oregon. And then last year I started a graduate program in community and regional planning. So it's a two year program. And what's really amazing is that the questions that I had that prompted me to go to school are finally getting answered in graduate school. And I didn't realize that the program was community and regional planning, that that's where the decisions are made and what communities look like, Western communities. So to know what the cultural issues and concerns are that I grew up with and seeing how the community did or did not respond to those, um, to those local needs is very interesting. So, um, how this all ties into native communities and climate change is that um, we all know that the climate's been changing for a long time and it's been indigenous people that have noticed the changes and that they rely so closely on the land. You remember I had said that my grandparents had gone to those different communities and so for different seasons. So when the snow, what happens is when the, there's the first freeze, there's a, 
a willow green. It's, it's called surah. Surah is the willow. It is prepared to grow at, at the time that it freezes. It's ready to grow. So as soon as the snow melts, it, it, the leaves um, open. And so that's when that plant could be harvested. So you could have just a land of white, but that willow is right there ready to be harvested. And then as soon as the snow melts off from the rocks, then there's this other little tiny shoot. You could hardly see it. And I've been gone for so long that I might not recognize it. It's muzu. It's an Eskimo potato. And so as that shoot comes up, then you can come and harvest the root. And, and so then from there, there's a series of other plants that become available for um, harvesting. So that's what's happening on the land. And then on the sea, as the winter storm, storms subside and there becomes leads in the water. So, um, you know, the, when I was growing up, the Bering Sea froze. So it would freeze so you could walk to Russia if you wanted to. Some people have. When the currents change, the temperatures change, the ice shifts and there are what become leads. So when the ice shifts just enough, there's be these leads where it's open water. And that is the time to go walrus and seal hunting. So spring walrus and seal hunting. So people would take their equipment to go on to the um, frozen Bering Sea. And um, so my grandparents, they would use the dog teams. And then nowadays people would use their snow machines and they would tow their boats. And you can see lots of videos of that type of activity being done. And the walrus and the seals would be harvested and the springtime, uh, animals are are very good because the fat that can be um, taken and preserved is different than the fat that you would get in the fall time. So what happened is, um, and then from there you get the sea mammals, and then you start. Um, you've seen the geese in the spring and in the fall. You see that when the sky is just filled with those geese, those are cackling geese. When they leave in the springtime, they're going to Alaska. And then when they come back, they're coming back from Alaska in the fall. So what happens is when the geese arrive, then it's all of the sea mammal hunting has been completed, and then it's time to get the geese. And after that, then it's the other land animals. So there's just this natural cycle. And then the geese, they leave. So then the geese come, you get the birds, then they lay their eggs, and you get some eggs. And then you just go on to the different animals that are, that are present and then the fish, and then the geese leave. So the, before the geese leave, that's your last chance to get some. But then before it freezes, you have another opportunity to get the walrus and the seal before the cold, long winters. And what's happened with the hunters is that they recognized that the ice was changing. And so when the early conversations about climate change were happening, some of those hunters' voices were being heard, but nothing was really being done. They were. Um, they weren't taken seriously um, be, because here, may, like my uncle, he had a seventh grade education. My grandpa didn't have any education and my grandma went to third grade. So when they started talking about these changes that they were seeing, what would they know? What could they possibly know? They didn't have any education. They didn't, you know, no college education and absolutely no experience with any type of environmental issue. So what could they possibly know? And so little changes like that just continued to happen. And... Um, so it got to the point where, um, I think it was in the 70s, that there was a big notice of how the winter storm patterns were changing. And people were noticing this and that the, just when the ice would come in. Have you seen the graphics of the Arctic, um, the polar ice cap? And how it used to be, you, you would see a map where the whole, I mean, below the Arctic Circle, it would be solid white. And now it's, you can see that it's much less. Well, what's happening with that ice cap is there is a permanent ice cap and it just kind of moves around in the current. And um, as the temperatures got colder, then the ice pack grew. And then pretty soon, the, just the whole Bering Sea, the Arctic Ocean was frozen. And what the hunters were noticing is that the condition of the ice was not stable. And now what they're finding, and you can see it in a model, is how the ice kind of shifts. So the, what is the old safe ice doesn't even come to the shore anymore. And so it's creating uh, some pretty drastic problems with, um, with the hunting conditions, what people were first complaining about, but it's also changing the storm patterns in that there's more open water longer because that 
comp, that really strong ice pack is not coming to the shore. And so that's where you're getting the coastal erosion. And that, th that's what I'm very interested in through my graduate program. I'm looking at the climate change adaptation plans and how, what the barriers are to implementation. Right now there are um, 30, 30 communities in Alaska that are facing relocation. And going back to the 70s, one of the communities was Shishmaraf. And so they tried to talk with the government about the changes that they were seeing, and it was kind of falling on deaf ears. And so after about 20 years, and they were saying, look, and say, you've, you've seen the pictures of the buildings falling into the ocean, into the Bering Sea. That is, um, usually those are Shishmaraf or Kivalina. That's where um, President Obama went last year. That's the areas where those communities are. And, but what they had done is they had tried to talk with the local governments about what's happening and they asked them to, to intervene and to come and study what's happening. And it really didn't happen until the 80s and the Army Corps of Engineers came in and they did an assessment and they recognized, yes, things are changing, but the responses would be too expensive. And so it just kind of sat. It was just an assessment that just sat and nothing happened. And then... Um, Ten years later, the tribal community, they did their own assessment again. They were able to get um, more attention from some scientists that did recognize that there were these changes. And so they did another plan, and just kind of, it was an assessment of what was happening. And that just kind of dwindled away, and nothing happened until last year. So there's, um, but unfortunately what's happened is that now everybody knows about Shishmaraf, and nothing has been done about Shishmaraf, and so now there's 29 other Alaska communities that are in the same situation as Shishmaraf. And so what do we do with um, these communities and climate change? Well, one, you look at the population of each of these communities and you have maybe two to 500 people, and when you're looking at policy decisions and where funding goes, what's the significance of doing anything, doing these multi-million, sometimes billion dollar projects to benefit 200 or 500 people. So it's very difficult. And, but these are the situations that these Native communities are in where, just like my grandparents, relying on the different resources at the different times of the seasons where there's this unpredictability, but then this Western government, this Western structure of living has been established. Remember, my grandparents didn't want to come to Nome. They had to to put their kids in school. And so now I'm part of this community and this culture that relies on all these modern amenities, which I'm very grateful for. But what do we do when you can't just up and move your community? What do you do when funding agencies don't want to pay for whatever you need to do? And what's, this, what's happening to these communities? The one big thing that I remember is it was in January of like 1980. I was, then I was only like five years old and just really developing, you know, knowing what I remember. But my uncle had gotten married and he was getting married at this community hall that was right along the Bering Sea. There's a rock seawall. And all that anybody could talk about was it was January and the ocean wasn't frozen yet. And so that was my first encounter with abnormal in that it was January and the ocean wasn't frozen. And even though I had grown up, you know, with all these Western amenities and Western education, there were still things that I relied on for, you know, with the natural clock, you know, school gets out when the geese arrive. That's it, in May. In Alaska, even today, school is out in May because so many people leave that um, they're, they're going hunting anyway. So that's when we get excited when we start seeing the geese, not because, oh boy, we get to go hunting, but oh boy, school's getting out. Mm -hmm. and, but then it's also, um, you know, the sun, it starts to come up longer, which I wanted to point out, uh, I think it was, it was just last week that Barrow said goodbye to the sun. So if you're not familiar with that, they have like 70 days of darkness, or, so they have like 70 nights. That's just a, a, a fun fact I wanted to bring to your attention. And, and what you could always count on is, and it was related to Halloween, that August things start to freeze. It starts to get dark and then things start to freeze. And after that first frost is when you gather the cranberries because that's when they're the most delicious. And then from there, it's just like miserable, cold, nothing. There's nothing left to harvest. There's, you might get a fish here and there, but you got to wait for the, the creeks and the rivers to freeze so you could get the fish. You got to wait for the ocean to freeze so you could get the crab. And, but what you could always rely on is that it would be frozen by Halloween. 
so that all the mud puddles would be frozen. And you could just go do all the trick-or-treating without the, all that mud. And, and it would be cold enough that it wouldn't be rain, it would be snow. And, and that's just not happening anymore. It's, so what's happening, um, there's so many changes that are happening that it's really difficult to think about where to start. And if you look at Western mo models of climate change and climate impacts, then they're looking at, well, what are the impacts on the land? What are the impacts on the plants? You know, what's it doing with the temperature? What's it doing with humidity? And all of those are true, but when you're living your life based on the natural resources that the land provides, then it looks different. It looks different from, um, yeah, there's too much rain, so the rain's taking the flowers off of the berries. So there's the little things like that. And just to give you um, some context, um, when I grew up, we had canned milk or powdered milk, and so often we chose not to have milk. I One of my favorite foods as a kid was having um, raisin bran with tang because I just despised powdered milk so much. I just despised it. So I'd rather have tang and, and raisin bran. And so even if I preferred, or the people today prefer to have fresh milk, it could be $8 a gallon you know, on sale. Maybe you might get two for $12 on sale. My um, uncle, he would come and stay with me in Oregon for long periods of time, and he would just get so excited about the meat. You know, how many of you buy ham hocks? Like, how many of you even get excited about ham hocks? Or do you know what ham hocks are? <laughs> it's, you know, it's just a big old joint of a pig. And you boil it, and you cook beans with it, and it's like, if you like that, it's deliciousness. And so you could imagine by your lack of interest in them how much they would cost here. Probably like five bucks. Oxtails. There was, uh, that, that was another 30 to $50 for oxtails. And here we could go to the butcher and they're like, you know, five bucks. They're like, they don't even have a price for them. They just say what they'll sell them to you depending on how many they have that day. So, um, and not very long ago they were free. Yeah, and so Peggy's saying, not, uh, yeah, not very long ago that type of meat was free. But you figure if the animal is cut, killed and harvested here. I, I don't know, do you still have cows? Do you still have one of the things that... The, that just cracked me up is he used to have cow. Well, they were beef, so, and that was a problem that I had growing up was they're not all cows. So are they beef, cattle, beef? They're something. You know what I'm talking about. So, you know, so they're the... They're the cows that you would kill for food, right? And you see different movies where you could like tip them. Like, have you all seen the, those of tipping? And so Dr. Henkels was talking about how it was time to butcher his cows. And I was like just thinking and I was just think, trying to figure out how's he gonna hunt those things? <laughs> and then I got to thinking, well, how do you hunt a cow when you could walk up to him and people just tip him over? So. It was little things like that completely baffle me because there's really not that much beef that we grew up with. You know, I grew up with moose and caribou, halibut and king crab, salmon, all of these things. And so those are the primary staples, the seal, the walrus, the whale, <coughs> all of those things that come from the land based on these seasons. And so if you wanted anything else, even bread, the stores run out of bread, like uh, just Wonder Bread where you could see pictures online of people just taking pictures of the empty racks. Like if uh, there's severe storms, well, I'll back up a little bit. So remember getting to Nome, it's a thousand miles from Anchorage. So you have to fly on a jet. And that would be like today, I, um, well, I won't even compare that. But you have to fly on a jet. So the mail, <coughs> the, um, all the supplies, all the groceries, they either come in on jet or they come in on barge. And the impacts that climate change are having is, um, I could go back, significant impacts that they're having is remember, um, traditional houses were subterranean. They were dug out and then there was a sod cover and then the snow would kind of just drift over it and reinforce it and insulate it. And there was just one little, um, it's called the eyuk, it's a, a vent where the smoke would come out and just kind of allow for circulation of air. And then you see like the igloo entrance. That snow shelter is emergency shelter. 
the, um, but that entrance, that kanitak, is a, a pathway for you to go in so you could take off your wet stuff so the, the cold and the wind doesn't come into the, the center of the house. But that house was a subterranean one. It wasn't the stereotypical snow house. And so you take this environment, this, this community, these people who lived very sustainably in a subterranean house, and then what's happened is that Western culture came and put it upside down. And when they put the houses directly on the soil, just in under those normal circumstances of the 40s, 50s, 60s, early 1900s even, those normal circumstances of development, the houses were causing the permafrost to melt, and so then they became unstable. And so the solution was to build the houses on stilts. And so now you have these, um, all the infrastructure that is built on permafrost. Do you know what permafrost is? It's like four to six feet below the top of the ground is frozen. So these houses are on stilts to prevent the permafrost from melting. With climate change, what's happening is these houses are, and the people are relying on oil. And what I like to... Um, what I like to say about those subterranean houses, and where I come from with that is the 10 years of working with the Arctic Collection and teaching people about the um, adaptations of Arctic people and technology. And so those subterranean houses, they were heated and lit by a seal oil lamp. And you might have seen some of those. So, um, so then you take the houses that are upside down, they're heated by wood, which is funny in the Arctic, the, one of the definitions of the Arctic is it's, um, it, it's measured by the tree line, where trees stop growing in dense populations. So you think about these wood-burning stoves and where, where does that resource come from and how much will there be? So it's oil. It's oil and propane that heat these houses. And if you remember, maybe it was three years ago, there was this big international activity that um, because the climate was changing, the season, the predictability of the ocean was... It, the ocean was unpredictable, so the barge carrying the last load of fuel to Alaska could not make it because the, it froze over. And so the U.S. had to negotiate with China and Russia for icebreakers and help to move oil into these communities. So that's, that's a huge impact. So what happened is when the prices of gas and oil were dropping here, I think it went up to $8 a gallon there. So, you know, that's one impact. There's the environmental impacts. There's the economic impacts. And that's just for housing. And we've already talked a lot about the impacts on food and the cost. So if you, um, going back to how things get there, it's either barge or it's by air. And what happens when it's too stormy and the planes can't fly or land, usually they can get to Nome, they can get to Kotzebue, they can get... Um, to Barrow, but if they can't bring everything, if everything comes to Nome, then there's all these villages that can't be serviced. And that was uh, another point that I wanted to make. Um, there are 229 tribes in Alaska. And so each of these tribes, when you're talking about Alaska communities and climate change, you're talking about 229 tribes that have their own group of indigenous people that are trying to respond. To these, to these major changes. And the needs and the impacts by each tribe are different. And the resources available to them to respond are different. So that's the environmental, the economic, the um, kind of the ecological with the access to the food. Um, do you have any questions about that? Question is, what are the native corporations doing to respond or help these communities respond to climate change? So I'm going to talk a little about the structure of the native corporations, but then also finish saying how it's different between those urban area, the urban and rural. And in Alaska, it's so much different in that most of the educated policymakers are in the the urban areas. And so they might have little or no contact with the people that are in the rural areas, just as the people in the rural areas may not have much contact or even interest in those urban issues, even though they all, they all trickle down. And um, so, you know, you've all heard about the election. That, <laughs> and seriously, this is, that's my point. That's exactly my point. And the day after the election, 
one of my Facebook friends who lives in one of these rural communities, her question was, what's the difference between Clinton and Trump? And I want to bring that to your attention because it's real. There are people that are so isolated that what happens in state and federal government is so opposite from what they need, like that $25 case of water that you experience, that's normal. Like if, it, if it's there, it's expensive, like the $8 um, gallon of milk or the bread. Bread usually doesn't go, it's usually not high price, you just can't get it. The eggs, it might be the onions. I mean, the onions that are throwaway here that you see people taking off the shelves, those are being sold for 3 to $5. And, and, and people are getting them because that's, that's what's there. And it's different. No, it's a lot different than it is for the villages. And so um, going back to the structure of the native corporations, there are 13 native corporations. So, um, so going back to the government structure, Alaska became a state in 1959. So that's not that long ago. And before then, it was a territory. And so it was pretty much a do-as-you-need-to territory. And um, one of my favorite books is about Sadie Brower Neocook. Margaret Blackman was a professor at University of Washington, and she wrote about Sadie. And Sadie talks about what it was like to be a magistrate, the first magistrate. She was a woman. There's no question about a woman being a magistrate, the first magistrate. She was the magistrate in Barrow. And the way that the society was structured, her community was structured, often she held court in her kitchen while she was butchering a seal or whatever meat was available. But that's, you know, so you, you just contrast that with the history of government in the United States and what it looks like in these Alaskan communities. It's different now. It's more structured now that it's a state. So in Alaska, it's the biggest state in the nation, right? It's twice as big as Texas. One percent of the property is owned by other. The rest is owned by the federal state government or the native corporations. And so just, just I mean, and that's completely opposite of what we see for property in the rest of the United States. So the native corporations, when they, they had to fight for that. And so it was the Na Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act in, I think it was 1971. So up until 19, let's see, civil rights was 1964, six, I can't believe I drew a blank on that. So, so there's civil rights, Native American rights didn't come until after the civil rights. So if you could imagine that. And so what happened was these, um, the Native activists, some have visited this campus, were lobbying in Washington, D.C. for rights and because they were non-existent. Like I had said before, how the city of Nome refused to acknowledge that Natives had a presence in that community until the Army Corps of Engineers. And to tell you, the, the, they were expanding the port. So the Army Corps of Engineers came in and they contracted with local workers. Year one of that project, they excavated a site and they covered it over. Year two of that project, they excavated the site and the locals said, no, you're not covering it over again. So if you search the Army Corps of Engineers and this gnome site, here they are with pictures, smiles and pictures of this wonderful find, this great historic cultural treasure that they saved. So what you see is not the way that it, it, it always happens. And so that's the way the natives were being treated. And so the lobbyists going to DC was very significant in that they were able to get this Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. And that put um, land, some of the land in trust, but it also developed these native corporations that um, would have these lands, that would manage these lands for the tribes. So there are 13. There are 12 in the, in the state, and the 13th is, um, it's called the 13th region, so it's for Alaska Natives who were not in the state during 1971, and so they would have this region to identify with. My region is, Kowarikmu is where I am, and then also um, it was a 1924 20, Indian Reorganiz Reorganization Act, I think you read about that. Through the Indian Reorganization Act, those 229 federally recognized tribes were established. So that was a government thing, creating those 229 tribes. Because remember, we identified ourselves in our own way. 
And so what happened was each of those tribes then fall under like this jurisdiction of a region. And so um, what that means, you know about the government to government relations. So for that structure, it happens to be in my region, which I'm most familiar with. It applies to the other 12 regions, but they have different names and people have different personal experiences and um, just they have different issues than what are in Norton Sound. Bering Straits Native Corporation is my, um, that's my region of the, of the 13, Bering Straits Native Corporation is my region. So they manage the lands. And they also had a, um, a corporation, so you could look at these 13 corporations and see what their subsidiaries are, and you could also see the difference in um, economic activity. And so Bering Straits Nor Native Corporation, as handling the lands and types of research and some of those government activities, they find different ways to respond to your question in lobbying with the government, the state and the local and the federal government and making sure that these services are available. Or if there's an issue um, in our, our region, the problem was um, Evergreen Aviation, which is Oregon based, they had the contract for bringing the mail to Diamond Island. And so they were unable to renegotiate or they didn't want to travel in certain times. So the community of Diamond, which is just a rock's throw away from Russia, because there's Little Diamond and Big Diamond, and Big Diamond is Russian, they were not getting their medical supplies, they were not getting their groceries, they were not getting their mail, they were not getting out, nobody was coming in. And so is it right for one company to have that much power in com controlling what does and does not happen within a community? So those are the type of big issues that the Native Corporation steps in and tries to work on. And they're the ones that would... Um, provide resources for the tribe and the tribal council so that they can be empowered to address those local issues, like the price of water. Most, um, most of the tribes have a tribal store, and that is meant to compete with whatever private store would have been there, so it makes things a little bit more manageable. But going back to those 13 corporations, what happened is the government structure said, okay, we're going to create these these 13 regions, these 13 corporations, you're going to have this land and then you're going to have this economic component. And so they gave all this power to these people who had very limited access to education. And so how well do you think they were able to run those businesses based on the, the mainstream models of business? A lot of them had problems, so then they went back and they restructured. So the question that I hear is, pretty much the adaptations to cli climate change and how culture is preserved. I, um, I didn't get to introduce, but my son Andrew is here, and he's got headphones on, and that is, <laughs> that's typical of that generation. So whether they're in Oregon or whether they're in Alaska, that's, that's it. You know, is there a desire, is there an interest to even participate in the culture? I think um, we all can relate to when we were teenagers, the, we might not have been really thrilled to do what our grandparents were doing. But as we get older, we become to appreciate it. We just appreciate it more and it has more meaning and we can duplicate what we saw them doing to the best that we can. And so there's just the impacts from climate change, but then there are also non-climate stressors, whether it be pollution, mining, um, fishing, different land uses that are inter interfering already with um, access and availability of these natural resources. And then on top of that, you have these fast cultural, social changes throughout the world in uh, Google and Facebook and all of these things that the last generation didn't even have. So these are all having impacts in, the, in these Alaska Native communities. And so how do, how do we respond? And so one thing that I grapple with is there are these climate change adaptation plans that I'm, I'm evaluating and I appreciate that. And so, and then there's native rights and there's sovereignty and I appreciate that. But what I grapple with is, okay, if we have this right to continue with the seal hunt or the whale hunt, that's more than ceremonial because where it is, this, the price of food is still so high. These are primary staples of food that we're talking about. That um, what happens with the pollution, because all the pollution goes up to the Arctic and it falls down. And so these, some of these animals are poisonous. You know, you look at, um, I haven't seen what the recent studies are, 
But with the earthquake in Japan and the nuclear waste, the Japanese current goes right up to the Arctic. And um, Dr. Spring has heard me talk about this before. If you go on the New York side, they have geothermal heat in New York. That's great. That's green, right? That's wonderful. What happens in the winter when it's cold, people turn on their heat, and then the water gets released. This hot water gets released into the waterways at a time that it's not meant to have warm water. So in that uh, the east, the Atlantic current, what's the current that goes up that way? It, the, it goes into the... Atlantic Ocean and then it goes up into the Arctic and what's happening is the water's freezing because salt water doesn't freeze the way that fresh water freezes and so it's having an impact on the ecosystem there. And so even if there is a desire to continue these hunts that rely on the open water, they're not accessible. The quality of the food might not be good. Um, <clears throat> during World War II, there was a lot of radioactivity happening in Alaska. So there was a period when people had to stop eating the caribou or they had to get regular um, radiation tests. And if their radiation levels were too high, they were told not to eat any more reindeer for a period. And this happened to um, Paul Jensen, the founder of the Jensen Arctic Collection. And so... Um, so even if the rights are maintained to continue the hunt, even if the climate allows these continuation of the hunts, what's the quality of the food? And you know what are these other impacts on culture? And then to top it off, what's the greatest thing about climate change and the melting of the Arctic ice cap? It's the Northwest Passage. Oh, yeah. That's like the best thing for the economy, isn't it? And so what happens to these communities that have 200 to 500 people and you have these massive cruise ships. So last year was the first time that a massive cruise ship went through the Northwest pa Passage. And so um, what I had read is that the average ticket was $20,000. So these passengers, what kind of interaction do you think they had with these native communities? You know, what's the impact? Who's going to benefit from that, from that type of activity? And so here you have these native communities, and that's the whole, the, I haven't said it, that, and you hear a lot about this in climate change discussions, is that the, the entities that cause climate change or the things that have caused climate change have disproportionate impacts on people affected by climate change. So we, we can ignore our impa the impacts of climate change in our daily life. We can go to the store, we could go buy whatever we want. We don't have to care about where it came from, the impacts that it has, the availability, the accessibility, the pollution, all of that. It doesn't matter. But any indigenous community across the world is suffering some sort of impact by the, just the consumption and the creation of these, these things that we, we take for granted. And they don't have the resources to protect themselves or even respond. And so that's what I'm looking at. Um, I'm studying five climate change adaptation plans from five different tribes. Three are in Alaska and two are in the Pacific Northwest. And I'm specifically looking for the barriers to implementing the plans. And so far what I found is funding. So like I said, who wants to fund a project that's going to benefit 200, 500 people? And, and then uh, and if you have to relocate 30 communities just in Alaska, you know, that's multi-millions and into the billions of dollars. Where does that, where is that revenue coming from? Where's, where's, how's that going to be generated? Where's that funding going to come from? And then how will those communities sustain themselves? And is it right to ask communities to move? And that's one thing I did, you know, just like the, with my grandma and my grandpa moving into Nome to put their kids into school. You know, was that right? Should that continue? Those are big issues, not related to barriers to implementing the climate change plans, but it's funding. Funding, the non-climate stressors, the um, requirement to network. So, um, so an example, and then it depends on the types of actions. So one of the options for these communities is called defend in place. So they are going to stay where they're at and they're going to do everything they can to alter nature to protect their environment. And so going back to Arctic history and the Reorganization Act and exploration into the Arctic, there were Western explorers who 
got into these environments and they didn't have the supplies or the knowledge they needed to survive. And so it was the indigenous people that um, rescued them, clothed them, fed them, um, kept them alive until they could be reunited on the next, or put on the next ship. And so Sheldon Jackson was the education general for Alaska, Oregon, Washington, and I think Idaho in the late 1800s and by Sheldon Jackson. And so by his account, um, the natives were starving. But what was really happening is that there were more explorers up there and they were starving and they didn't like the seal meat. They didn't like the whale meat. They didn't like the fermented seal flipper or you know whatever was available. And so he found a way to get the United States government to contract with the Sami, the indigenous reindeer herders of northern Norway, Sweden, and Finland, to come to the United States with their reindeer. And they would, so they would bring their reindeer to Alaska and they would teach the natives how to herd. And reindeer are domesticated caribou. And they, they, um, they have reindeer in Russia, but the story is that Sheldon Jackson did not like the way that they did their husbandry, so he abandoned the Russians coming over with their reindeer and preferred the Sami. And so the Sami came with the reindeer, and Western capitalism took over. The white people were owning the reindeer, and they were competing with the beef market. And so the U.S. government had to intervene because the reindeer were becoming the new beef. And so the, 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 the federal law was that no non-natives could own reindeer. And what happened, these indigenous nomadic reindeer herders from Norway, Sweden, and Finland had Western appearances, so they, could, they became displaced, they lost their herds. And in, in lieu of this training and bringing their reindeer, they were promised their own herd. So they were supposed to be able to sustain themselves. So they became a displaced population by by those regulations. And so um, some people continued with the reindeer herding, but it's just very difficult. It's not an indigenous activity to herd the animals. It's more, more natural to go with the natural cycles. And then that's the, another significance of climate change is that those natural cycles are so unpredictable. I used to like to say how my uncle got electricity. You know, I, it used to be last year, now it's been six years. But imagine just six years ago getting electricity in your house and still not having running water. You know, so that, you know, why? Why, if that's an essential, why are there communities in America that don't have that basic infrastructure? Why are there barriers to, um, to getting that infrastructure? And, and that reminds me another big impact, a huge climate change impact and it's related to the disproportionate impacts that climate change has on indigenous people is the health impacts. So there's just a tremendous amount of health, health impacts that are happening um, physically and emotionally and, and all of that with climate change. Can you imagine hearing, um, oh yes, you need, you need that, but, or like you need oil to heat your house okay, we're going to do everything to get it for you, but you're going to have to pay $8 a gallon where maybe your median income was $20,000, maybe $18,000, you know? So imagine needing something like that and not being in control of even the prices. You all are amazing. I mean, you're very attentive, and I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs>